Welcome you all and thank you again for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Stephanie McLaughlin. I'm the Training and Evaluation Specialist with Partners Resource Network. Partners Resource Network is the nonprofit agency that operates the Texas Statewide Network of Parent Training and Information Centers. We are funded through the Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. The PTI projects in Texas are PACT, PATH, PIN, and TEAM. And at Partners Resource Network, we strive to empower and support Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. Also joining us today from Partners Resource Network is our Director of Statewide Services, Christina Henning, and our Support Specialist, Chelsea Rivas. If you're having any technical difficulties today, please reach out to Chelsea or myself in the chat box and we'll be happy to assist you with those. In the chat box, you'll notice a link to the PowerPoint presentation, so you can download your own copy with that link. And for those of you that are needing a certificate of attendance, we've gotten a few questions already. We will be sending out an email tomorrow to thank you for attending today's webinar. If you'll follow the link in that email, you'll be able to get your certificate of attendance. Um, today, we're going to have a Q&A time at the end of the presentation. So if you will, if you're joining us on Zoom, if you will put your questions for our presenter in the Q&A box, we'll be sure and catch those. If you're joining us on Facebook today, you can put those in the comments and we'll catch those. Also, there will be a recording of today's webinar available on our website at prntexas.org. So be sure and check that out. Um, Today's webinar is a collaborative effort between Partners Resource Network and SpedTex. So joining us today from SpedTex is Gracie Whitley. Gracie, I'm going to let you take a minute and share about SpedTex. Okay, had a little trouble with the mute button. But <laughs> hi, um, SpedTex is the Special Education Information Center for the state of Texas. And we are a collaborative project between Region 10 Education Service Center and Texas Education Agency. So should you have any questions, concerns about special education, you're welcome to contact us at SPETEX, where we will share information and resources to help you address whatever that concern may be. Our contact information is noted here on the screen. And also just a little bit about Region 10 Education Service Center. Um, we provide service support and solutions for uh, students, parents, educators in the Region 10 service area. And so it's our pleasure to be a part of this event, SpetTex, as well as Region 10. Thank you, Gracie. Really appreciate you being here today and doing this with us. Um, also, as a reminder, to let you know that after today's presentation and Q&A session, we will be having a focus group. Please plan on staying after the webinar for this focus group and sharing your thoughts with us. It'll be immediately after, and we'll be doing it in English and in Spanish. So please stay on and join us for that. So I'd like to take a minute now and introduce our speaker. Our presenter for today is Erin Kaczynski. Erin is the education, Educational Resource clinician at North Texas Behavioral Health Authority, serving and supporting educators and improving their mental health awareness as part of the Region 10 Education Service Center. Erin is a licensed professional counselor in clinical practice in Collin County and will complete her PhD in counselor education and supervision this summer. Erin has experience supporting individual youth and adults across the Metroplex in a number of clinical mental health settings. Her clinical specialty is counseling individuals with trauma and anxiety. Um, welcome, Erin. So glad to have you join us today, and we're going to um, turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, ladies. I appreciate it, and welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you guys can all now see my screen, and we're just going to get this party started. I wanted to just kind of go through some tips for fostering resilience in anxious children. I know with, um, with the uh, onset of COVID this year, there's been an increase in an uptick in everybody's anxiety. And so let's go over some, some 10 tips. And, and just to kind of uh, full disclosure, I did research um, or sort of like a gentle research and reached out to a lot of my colleagues that serve children. And so just to make sure that I was capturing 
all the best tips um, for resiliency in kids. So we kind of did this as a group project, but let's let's go go forward with tip number one. So with tip number one, I would say um, to help your kids with um, with anxiety with their anxiety is really to help increase their overall stress tolerance. So stress tolerance is that ability for people to stay calm when they're faced with stressful situations without letting these big emotions take over. And so, you know, you can't, re you can't remove all of these stressors in life, right? Life is full of stressors, but you can um, help your kids by helping them cope with and manage their sy symptoms. So helping them learn to tolerate these anxious and stressful and worried thinkings um, and so helping them to better function um, even when they are feeling anxious and when they're not feeling anxious, right? So just overall coping strategies. And so helping them create um, emergency plans. These are some things that we're going to talk about here a little bit more um, in a minute, but also, you know, helping them understand what they can do when they have all of these negative thoughts or worried thoughts swimming inside their brains. How can they regulate their breathing when they're kind of feeling like their heart is beating out of their chest? Um, what can we help them? Um, how can we help them tolerate um, those fearful stimuli? Like if they're scared of dogs, how do we, um, what are some ways that we can help decrease um, that stressful response to things like a scary dog barking at them? Um, and then, you know, being away from mommy, how can we decrease um, their stress level that they're experiencing when mom goes away. And things like, um, like fearful stimuli and being away from mom um, would be sort of, um, you know, exposure, you know, kind of slowly exposing them, getting them closer to that stimuli or leaving for shorter amounts of time and, and lengthening the amount of time that you would be away, right? So they get exposed to the fearful response slowly and gradually they get, they build up that stress tolerance over time. So I think that um, and when it comes to helping kids really develop that stress tolerance, another really good skill, which we'll address again later, is modeling good stress management. Um, so good stress management is good um, practice for supporting your kids and learning those types of skills. I had a client that used to jokingly refer to that process as monkey see, monkey do. Like if I show my child how to handle these stressful situations and how to overcome situations that cause me stress, then she'll learn some really good stressful strategies, good strategies for managing those stressful situations. For older kids, they don't really, really want to do exactly what mom or dad does or guardian does. So maybe finding YouTube videos with um, influencers that are positive, that they respect, um, that can teach stress tolerance techniques. So we're going to get more detailed strategies here in a second. So tip two, you do not want to avoid difficult, uncomfortable, or stressful situations. As a parent or guardian, right, the thing that we want to do more than anything in the world is protect our children. I totally get it. Um, but when we come to their rescue, it really only teaches them to be res reliant, not resilient. And so when we allow them to engage in avoidance, we're really just endorsing that stress response. And so what we want to do is you know, allow them <laughs> to experience some of these stressful situations, uncomfortable situations, encourage them to um, expose themselves to these situations. But again, um, it can be smaller amounts of time. It can be, um, if they're afraid of going out in crowds, we, we do smaller crowds um, before we, you know, take them to a baseball game, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, if they're afraid to go out because they're afraid to get sick, maybe going out for a short amount of time around a small number of people, right? So slowly integrating them to that fearful response before, you know, just dropping them in. 
Um, you know, sometimes we have to do the best we can do. Sometimes we have to just kind of drop them in and hope that they swim, um, but just providing lots of love and support on the back end and, and providing some strategies for, you know, managing some of those uncomfortable situations. And yeah, I see that somebody put narratives help discussing situations. Um, they can connect the dots, how to handle it in their own situation. Absolutely. Um, and sometimes it's like giving, giving them, them a situation of like, you know, mommy used to be really afraid of spiders. And so, you know, she couldn't be in the room with a spider. So eventually, you know, she started to get closer to the spider and then she could be like right next to the spider and then she could pick the spider up with a piece of paper and then for, you know, maybe for three seconds and then she could do it for a minute, right? So teaching them like what mommy or daddy had to do to, to overcome those fears um, and what strategies. Again, this is kind of that modeling piece where you can kind of tell them a story and it doesn't have to be your story. It can be somebody else's story, um, like your sister or your brother or your friend. So let's go to tip number three. Tip number three is about being empathetic about these stressful feelings. And Empathy is really feeling with somebody, not feeling sorry for somebody, but being able to just kind of sit in that dark space with them and say, you know, gee whiz, I don't know how you're feeling, but I, I can tell that it's really hard for you, right? And so we want to help our kids challenge them gently, right? To, to, challenge, to challenge them to really confront some of those fears. Because if children are, have the ability to confront these fears, knowing that there's love and support, that it's going to be okay, they're going to gain more confidence over time. So remember, when you're afraid of something, you're afraid. You believe that your fear is very realistic. So, you know, I get it. It's very, very scary. And there's things that I'm scared about. But sometimes these are things that we may have to do in our lives. So we're going to slowly expose ourselves to that fearful response or I'm going to do it with you, or we're going to partner with somebody that can do it with you, whatever that is to kind of decrease it. If it's, you know, studying for a test, we're going to practice studying for the test several times to kind of de-escalate that fear response. Um, if they're afraid to, you know, stand up in class, um, maybe practicing doing it in um, a if they're afraid of standing up in class and reading their paper, maybe they do it in front of the family to kind of decrease those fears we're desensitizing, right? Um, but providing with that empathetic listening, really hearing their story, understanding why they're afraid, not minimizing their fear, not telling them they shouldn't be afraid about that, just allowing them to express their emotions and use their language is very important. If we don't allow them the time to process that and we shut it down, then they might not come to you for some of the bigger stuff. So just remember, even though it's not a big deal for us, it is a big deal for them. So helping them understand what it is they're afraid of and naming it, right? Naming it as fear and then kind of helping them go, okay, well, what's scary about that? What's the worst thing that might happen? And is that worst thing, is that so, so terrible? Is it just kind of terrible? you know, and really exploring what that, what that's about. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm checking the chat. Um, so I always say embrace an it'll be okay attitude, um, an it'll be okay home environment. Um, you know, my, uh, I have a friend, colleague who's, who has a, we're going to shake off the day as part of the um, coming home strategy for her girls. So it's, we're going to shake it off. Like when the song from Taylor Swift came out, the shake it off song, that was a big thing. And so it's kind of become a ritual in their family because her kids are a little bit anxious too. Um, and so with, with, um, with kiddos who um, are anxious, we want to make sure that at home, in our own attitudes towards their, fear, their fearfulness, their stress, their anxiousness. We, we, want to, we want to write the empathetic. Their fear may be realistic. Um, the outcomes of a situation, those outcomes might not be favorable, but it's okay. You can handle setbacks. You can handle disappointment at the end of the day. We love you. We're here for you, no matter what. Um, it's, you know, at, at the end of the day, we got you, right? That is the kind of attitude that you want to try and set with your kids. You want to try to create an environment that supports the recognition of that fearfulness, 
of that fear response to things, but we also want to at the same time combat any stinking thinking, right? So um, when one thing goes badly, um, we can be quick to think that all things are going to fall apart. Um, but just because one thing goes badly, not all things are bad. Sometimes we feel crummy, we feel sad, we feel frustrated. We help them use those words, right? Um, unfair things are going to happen. But it doesn't mean that we need to close ourselves off. It doesn't mean that we need to use avoidance. It doesn't mean that we need to treat, retreat or throw fits. Um, we don't need to cut ourselves off or feel like the world is going to fall apart, hide in our room. We just need to shake it off. We need to process. We need to talk about our feelings. And then we need to come up with some strategies that can help us calm down, deal with the frustration, manage our symptoms, or just shake off the cruddy feelings. <laughs> so let's go to tip five. Tip five is really adding, um, avoiding adding anxiety, um, especially when you have a child who's already anxious. So this is something I see parents actually do quite often in a very, very innocent way. So what will happen is something like, um, are you, aren't you feeling anxious about the big test? Aren't you feeling anxious about the big game? Aren't you worried about the big game? Or are you worried about the big game? If the kids aren't feeling anxious or aren't reporting anxiety about the game, um, and you ask them, aren't you feeling anxious or are you anxious? Then in their minds, they might be going, okay, does she think I should be worried about the game? Does she think I should be worried about the test? I keep saying she, but it could be they or, <laughs> or, or he. Um, but do my, do my loved ones think that I should be worried? Should, you know, um, should I be concerned? Are they not confident in me? That can create that type of thinking. And so they may believe if you lack confidence, then they really should be worried. And so this happens often. Um, oftentimes when um, that's, that fear is sometimes about you. The parent is nervous, like, oh my gosh, what if he doesn't do well on the test? Oh my gosh, what if she doesn't do really well on the game? And so they're projecting their own worry onto their child, and then it can create anxiety and worry in the child that isn't even there. And so, um, you know, remember that healthy, rational, fear and worry is good. And so if they are reporting, you know, if kids are reporting anxiety, we want to explain, you know, that fear is there for a reason, right? That is our natural, natural, like in, innate DNA response to a scary situation, right? We want to have a little bit of that fear response. Um, that's the thing that keeps us safe, right? From, a, from, from way back in the day when we were cavemen, it's the thing that keeps us safe. And so, um, it's the chronic worry that affects our day-to-day -day functioning that we really want to help them overcome and really want to help them um, avoid getting stuck in. And so we don't want to throw any extra anxiety into their already heavy backpack. So tip number six, we want to help our kiddos to desensitize from these stressful situations. So, um, when I talk about um, desensitizing, that means that we are exposing ourselves to these stressful events in small incremental bits, right? Um, so like the example with fearfulness about a dog, um, I worked with a young lady that got not as a counselor, but in a different capacity, I worked with a young lady, she got bit by a dog, so then, all dogs were scary. So, um, you know, super hyper vigilant fearfulness about dogs. So it was really about being able to be on the same street with a dog. Then with, because as soon as she'd hear a dog bark, that startle response would activate and she would be kind of just frozen. And so it was all about slowly kind of exposing her, her getting desensitized to the sound of a dog barking like, you know, I know that sounds scary, but the dog's far away. The dog's down the street, so we're going to be okay. Let's practice our breathing. Let's, you know, let's do the things that help us calm down. 
and then you know slowly getting closer the dog the dog's behind a gate the dog can't get to you and then working up to maybe other dogs like are there smaller dogs that we can expose her to are there different um, kinds of dogs that are maybe more friendly so that all dogs aren't bad dogs right so there are different ways to kind of desensitize based on the situation um, the same thing could be like with going out in public maybe smaller um, uh, going out into smaller venues before bigger venues um, it could be like, I'm scared to talk to boys because boys are, are scary and they are judgmental and I'm a teenager and I'm kind of scared to talk to boys. And so maybe it's like slowly having a conversation about what kind of snacks they like to eat or there are different ways to kind of make those um, fearful situations a little bit less scary. Um, with kids with disordered eating, like we're slowly introducing sugar into their diet or some maybe some of those foods that they have on their foods I cannot eat because they will make me fat list. And so kind of slowly exposing them to eating more calories or eating more sugar, bringing in an all foods fit perspective into their diet. Same thing would be with something like test prep right? So testing, test taking is scary. So are there ways that we can prep them to take tests? Maybe we can practice tests at home. Maybe we can work with the school to get a scenario where we can um, go and take the test, practice test at the school in the same environment. Um, maybe it's, you know, practicing what that routine is going to be like the day of the test. Um, if we're afraid of, um, of the dark, maybe, right? Probably a lot of y'all are doing that, right? We use it, we use the closet door for a little while, then we move to a nightlight, then we move to no light at all. Then <laughs> so just slowly exposing them so that it's not going from very, very fearful to being dropped into the bottom of the ocean. We're kind of just slowly integrating, slowly introducing them to that stress response so that it's not so scary. So let's move to tip number seven, taking care of yourself. Now, have you heard that saying that you gotta put your mask on yourself before you can put it on somebody else? That's really what I'm talking about here. Um, as parents, um, we really have to be able to take care of ourselves to be able to teach it to our kids. Um, we can probably teach it to our kids, but here's the deal. Kids, especially those younger ones, are going to base their sense of safety in the world off of the perceived safety of their caregiver. So if you're okay, then they're okay, right? And so if you're not okay, kids are going to pick up on that. Little kids, older kids, any <laughs> kids of any age, they know when you're not okay. They know when they can tell um, when you're super stressed. Um, they can see it. They may not have the words to name it but they know that mom isn't okay. And if mom isn't okay, then I'm not okay. So I'm gonna be afraid. So really taking care of yourself. Um, and, and again, um, we're gonna talk about it in just a second. Modeling, that is really important. So you taking care of yourself is really helping you um, with your children who are experiencing anxiety because it's very hard, especially if you have a child that's really, really struggling. Um, to support them when you're not supporting yourself. So the next thing I would say is what I said just a second ago, we really want to make sure that we can model what calm and resiliency looks like. You're not perfect. I'm not saying that you have to be calm and that you have to be resilient all the time. We are imperfect people, but that's good because you want your kids to see that you're imperfect, but then that you can be okay, right? So it's okay to model mistakes and errors because then kids go, mommy made a mistake and mommy got really upset, but then mommy got okay because she did the following things, right? And I keep saying mom, but it could be dad or caregiver or anybody, right? Um, that, is, that is an adult figure in their life. It could be counselor at school, right? So we wanna be able to um, let those kiddos see you managing your anxiety in a calm way or in a restorative way and overcoming difficult situations by using healthy coping skills. Um, I know that I've worked with people that are like, you know, at the end of a hard day, I have a glass of wine. And I was like, is that always the thing that you do when you come home? Because your kid tells me like, 
I, when I ask them how mommy manages stress, mommy has a glass of wine when she gets home. So maybe we can show your child some other coping strategies other than you having a glass of wine when you come home. That's fine, but that's what your kid is seeing. So what are maybe some other strategies that you can do um, to really um, support um, your resiliency? And that particular case, she did a lot of really good things, but that's the thing that the kid saw and brought up in session more than one time. <laughs> so um, like I said, kids watch everything that their parents do. And so um, there are a multitude of different strategies. And then, you know, if you can, if your child is willing to um, engage in some of those strategies with you, then, that, then that's great too. I've actually um, seen many parents do that effectively with their kids in a variety of different ways. So, helping kids create really good coping strategies or even like so-so coping strategies. <laughs> they don't have to be perfect, right? Um, some strategies are gonna be hit or miss, right? We might try something and it doesn't work and that's okay. Um, in this little picture, we see grandma's just engaging in play, right? So we're just gonna engage in some really healthy, happy play with our granddaughter in this case. And so let's run through some, some coping strategies that I have used and I've seen parents use with their kids that have been really helpful. So one of the things that I like to do is uh, with a lot of the younger people that I've worked with is get together with their, with their kid, um, sorry, get together with the child. And sometimes we're including the parent on this. It depends on the child and it depends on the symptoms, but we're creating a self-care plan. So what does that look like? And so when I say a self-care plan, I like it to be multidimensional. I like to say, focus with kids, I like to focus on four areas of self-care. I call it happy heart, happy mind, happy spirit, happy body. So that's happy heart, happy mind, happy spirit, and happy body. And I'm gonna post this for you here. So, right, what could be a happy heart activity. It can be things that make us feel good inside. Happy mind is things that help our minds calm down. Healthy spirit can be anything from religiosity to things that make us feel purposeful. It can be things that make us feel calm. It can be connecting with nature. A lot of kids call it different things. Um, and so, um, however you want to define that, and you can replace spirit with a different word. Um, and then happy body, it's really like what exercise, taking care of ourselves, getting enough sleep at night. Um, I will also put in happy relationships or healthy relationships. That might be another one that I add. It just really depends on the child in the situation. And so we create, you know, what are some things that we can do? So when we're feeling anxious, what do we do to calm our heart, to calm our mind, to calm our spirit, to calm our body? And I tailor it to the child. Um, now, we also do what I like to call, and it, it's out there, you can Google this type of stuff also, an emergency self-care plan. So an emergency self-care plan, right? These other health self-care ideas are things that we wanna do on a daily basis, right? An emergency self-care plan are those things that we do when we are in crisis mode. Now, if we don't use our coping strategies on a daily basis, using those strategies during crisis mode, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> with adults and with kids, if we haven't been practicing those strategies when we're calm, it isn't gonna work when we're stressed. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to implement a new coping strategy when you're stressed out. I have, it never works. <laughs> I'm like, this is not helping. This is making me more anxious because I can't do it. Um, and so really focusing on building some of those healthy strategies, they probably already have some strengths and skills that they're already using, but they're not really connecting to as calming. Um, you know, kids, for some teen girls, it's like putting on makeup or, you know, doing their hair. Sometimes things like that can be calming. For guys, it can be, you know, kind of disconnecting playing video games for a little while or, you know, doing like some kind of a sport can be really relaxing. 
Um, those are very gendered um, <laughs> uh, activities, but it can be anything for anybody. I mean, a guy could enjoy putting on makeup, whatever. Um, but um, whatever is, is helpful for them. So look to their strengths, right? The things they're already doing well, and then add in, maybe add in some new things that can also be calming. And so once we get some, you know, some good strategies going, some things that we know are helpful, how can we implement those things into those emergency situations? So when it comes to emergency self-care plans, we want to know when do we, when do we get activated? When is our anxiety really triggered, right? Is it before a test, before, before a game, before I um, hang out with a cute girl or boy, um, you know, what is it that kind of triggers that stress response and gets us kind of responding in ways that aren't helpful or maybe makes us get reactive. So what can we do in those situations to calm us down? There might be a calm down strategy that's different for every stress response. So, you know, I've had people that, um, you know, that have the stinking thinking at night, the ruminating at night. And there might be things like journaling that calm them down. But when they get anxious before a test, that doesn't help. There might be other strategies that help them to calm down before a test. And so it's pairing a good strategy with a stressful response that can really help us when we're talking about that emergency self-care plan, especially in kids who are displaying sort of that panic disorder type of presentation. So another great strategy. And literally, you can Google pro, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. And there are plenty of videos available online that will talk you through progressive muscle relaxation. So what, um, what progressive muscle relaxation is, is, is a series of tensing and releasing the muscles. And so um, this is really good, even in kids that really aren't that anxious, but maybe um, just have tight tension in their body. Um, these, this chart has basically the steps that you would do to, to um, actually release some of the tension in the body. I like teaching this to kids and then having parents do this with their kids. The best time to do progressive muscle relaxation when you're first learning it, I would say, is right before bed. That's typically when my clients, regardless of age, really enjoy doing it. With my little littles, like the elementary school aged kids, this is like a great thing that mom and child can do as they're like going to bed at night. Like, hey, let's like, like let's lay down in bed together and we're gonna do this for five minutes. First, we're going to we're gonna squeeze lemons. And so we'll squeeze our hands tight, 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 as tight as we can. We'll hold it for a count of four and then release. Um, I usually will teach deep breathing before I teach progressive muscle relaxation because we'll use our deep breathing counts while we're doing our progressive muscle relaxation. So if you do in for four, out for four, then we're going to hold for four and release for four. If that, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I can make these slides be available. I'm not sure panel if we can do that. Perfect. Thank you so much. And it sounds like um, somebody is doing this before a test to relax. And this is, this is like my favorite thing to do with um, youth before they do tests. And actually when I teach college, um, I teach counseling at the college level. And this is something I do with my students before they're gonna take a test or if they're anxious about seeing their first client. Um, but basically knowing where the tension is in their body and we'll pick those areas. When we're first learning this, we might do a full body scan. We'll start with our hands, we'll move to our wrists and forearms, we'll do our biceps. If you're just gonna pick a couple, the ones that I think are the most helpful are hands, shoulders. I like to do the cheek or the jaw, like the smiling as big as you can, because the kids think it's fun. Um, <laughs> um, we also will do the back, the tummy, and then we do the lower legs or the feet where we dig our toes into the mud. There are some really good videos um, that actually do um, examples. So like hands, I do squeezing lemons. Um, when we do shoulders, I tell them to be a tortoise like and go inside their shell. Um, when we do stomach, I say an elephant's coming, he's gonna step on your stomach. You wanna tighten your stomach muscles. And then with, with the toes, it's digging your toes into the, into the gooey mud. So sometimes using um, with littles, Sometimes using those images really helps them to do 
those different activities. I'm glad that this is helping for some of you guys. This is a really good, if kids are having tension, this is a really good strategy and it's pretty fun. I, I've had a lot of, you. if you teach this to kids, um, especially if you're a school counselor and you teach this to your kids, a homework assignment is to do this with a mom or dad or guardian or an older sibling and teach this to them. That's their homework assignment. And then I make, you know, I've had a, a teacher have the kids sign off, have the, the family members sign off that they taught it to them, right? So when they learn how to teach it, they know how to do it, right? So the other thing that is really great coping strategy is um, really managing that rumination. And so rumination is the constant thoughts and constant worries that are going on in our heads, right? This usually happens a lot of times for kids before bed and they don't sleep. So things that people use to manage um, rumination are things like meditation, trying to stay in the here and now. Um, there's actually a video online called, um, if you Google, be the pond. There's a really good, it's for little kids, <laughs> but older kids can do it too, where they are imagining all of these different feelings in their bodies and how they are at, at all these fish are swimming in the pond, but they just have to be the pond, right? Calm themselves down. Also another thing to Google would be something called a rainbow walk. It's where you're going around and you're noticing all, so all the colors of the rainbow, right? So you'll walk around, find something red, something orange, something yellow, something green, something blue, then something red, something orange, something yellow, something green, something blue. And so instead of worrying about your stinking thinking over here, we're worried about finding something that matches the colors and we're going through it in kind of a rainbow. You can do that when you walk around the room or you can just do it by sitting in your chair. Also with older kids, it's things like renaming uh, or reframing that negative thinking. So if you're thinking that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible, I'm a horrible person. So are you really a terrible, hor horrible person? Or you, did you have a situation where you didn't respond appropriately? So we want to kind of re reframe that so it's not this all or nothing thinking. Another thing I will teach kids to do is to argue with their inner critic, right? We have these negative thoughts or these negative voices in our head that hopefully not real voices in our head, but um, thoughts in our head that tell us things like I'm worthless or uh, I'm stupid. And so we want to teach ourselves um, how to argue. And so the way I like to do is putting our thoughts on trial. And so if say somebody has the thought I'm worthless, I like to ask two questions. Is this realistic and is it helpful? So the first thing is, is it realistic? Is the thought I'm worthless a realistic thought? So what's the evidence that supports I'm worthless? Show me the evidence. And then who is somebody in your life that's gonna support I am worthless? If you know that they have somebody in their life, this might not be the right strategy, right? Or you can say, so there's one person, but there's 17 people that think um, that this is not a realistic thought. So one versus 17, you know, that's not a, if we were at trial, it would be a hung jury, right? So these 17 people would outweigh the one person, right? So can we agree that it's not really realistic that you're worthless? Is it helpful? Does it help you to feel you're worthless? If it doesn't help you to feel that and it's not realistic, then let's come up with something else to say instead. Um, maybe I'm not good at this particular activity or something that's more adaptive, right? To kind of calm our inner critic down. I like to argue with my inner critic. And so sometimes kids like to give their inner critic a name and we tell the inner critic to shut up <laughs> or to be quiet. So some other things that you can do as coping strategies, I always say exercise is a great strategy when you can find um, ways to do it with other people that are supportive people, that's just a bonus. Laughter is always very good medicine. Kids really connect with music as a coping strategy for their anxiety. And so um, we just, you know, I like to, some kids um, <laughs> like to listen to music that I feel like might be anxiety provoking, but they say it calms their anxiety down. So, you know, different strokes for different folks. Play can be, um, a lot of times play, it may seem like the kids are playing really aggressively, but sometimes kids, you remember the kids with the, with play, um, that is them, you know, working out things in their language. Um, and so we want to encourage kids to play, um, but um, 
Sometimes it might look like they're playing aggressively with themselves, but if they're not harming themselves or something else, allow them to kind of work it out. Um, fun activities with friends, um, calm down kits, you can Google that. Um, you can create kind of a space or some kind of a kit that has a lot of different calm down strategies <clears throat> or calm down um, activities in that box or that space. So I would say it's all, it, it, are the objects are things that meet the five senses. So maybe something that has a calming smell, that feels calming, that sounds calming, that looks calming, um, that tastes calming. Um, and so I like to, now the important thing is if you're gonna create a kit or a space, we only go to that space or we only go to that kit when we need to calm down. We don't play with it all the time. We don't go to the space all the time. That space is for calming down, right? And so if you can create a space like that or a kit like that, it's very, very helpful. Um, and so I talked about changing um, negative thinking. Um, we already talked about that in managing elimination. So tip number 10 is knowing when to seek um, professional help when symptoms are um, severe, um, unshakable symptoms that are totally unrealistic. So for example, the kid is saying, um, I know I'm gonna have a heart attack, I'm gonna have a brain tumor and I'm gonna die, but they're in perfectly good health. Um, you know, those are unrealistic fears. That might be something that, you know, that fearfulness is, is unmanageable if, if, you know, if it's a, it's a four-year-old or five-year-old thinking about dying, um, you know, and they're constantly obsessed with and fixated on dying, we may wanna, seek some professional help to kind of work through some of that fear. Um, if something is disproportionate, so if the severity of symptoms is disproportionate, so say you have a fifth grader that's worried, up and worried all night um, because they're worried that they're not gonna get into college. Um, that's really disproportionate. A fifth grader shouldn't be worried about getting into college. Although I've had some junior high kids worried about those types of things, getting the right grades so that they can get into college in junior high. And so, um, you know, obviously they're coming to see me, so they're, they're on the right track. So um, when, when uh, another reason would be when those severe anxiety is, is so severe that they're becoming overly self-conscious. So maybe it's something like, I can't eat food in public because people will call me fat. And so they're really hypervigilant about not eating in public. And then it gets, you know, more and more severe with time. Um, so if, if, if it's causing them to be overly self-conscious, then maybe getting professional help is, it would be helpful. Um, severe anxious symptoms that aren't increasing over time. So maybe you've gone through some different coping strategies. You think you're on the right track, but those symptoms just really aren't, you know, getting better over time. And so an example of that might be, you know, maybe an after a burglar comes to the house or maybe after there's been a tornado in the area and the kids are afraid to sleep outside the closet or without some kind of protection. Um, then, you know, maybe they're experiencing some, some post-traumatic stress. And so you want to get them some additional help because nothing else is working and it's just getting worse. Um, we want to um, get professional help when those symptoms are resort, resulting in things like avoidance or isolation. Um, like I said, the, the, you know, a girl that's afraid of, you know, got bit by it, got bit by a dog, by a really big dog that doesn't like kids. So now she's avoiding even a cute little, you know, fluffy Pomeranian that doesn't bite. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that um, we're getting those kids help because we don't want them to, you know, create this, this serious phobia of dogs over time. And then, you know, if, if the child is, um, developing new or increased symptoms just in general. Um, you know, you're seeing um, all of a sudden now you're seeing sadness or you're seeing increased hypervigilance or there's a lot of restriction um, going on, then you definitely want to seek some professional help and support, support the kiddo. So um, I was going to take 45 minutes to go through all of these tips and um, hopefully some of these uh, different tips are helpful for you. Hopefully that you got some um, great ideas and I just wanna open it up to some questions. Um, I did see um, a question in the chat that said, what should you say to a teen who always says they feel a lot of pressure to live up to or match the success of others? So I would wanna understand where that pressure is coming from. 
usually when we are saying we have to be this or we must be that or we should be this, the shoulding and musting is coming from somewhere. Um, people don't typically impose these on themselves. There's some kind of outside factor, environmental, family, what have you. Um, it could be friends that are creating this, I have to be this. Um, usually there's a fear of if I don't do this, then this will happen. So I would want to understand the voice of the fear, right? I would want to understand what is, <clears throat> where is the pressure coming from? And then what happens if we don't live up to what is, what's going to, what's going to happen? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? And understand that fear and work towards, um, resolving the fear related to that or addressing that fear therapeutically. So that probably there's some, some underlying fear that if I don't do this, then this will happen. Um, if a child is threatening to hurt themselves, um, even by actions that aren't severe, but still threatening like pulling hair, hitting themselves, I would probably, um, if they're harm, if they're engaging in any kind of self injurious behavior, I would probably seek um, some professional advice um, because there might be something more going on and get them just kind of evaluated by a, a mental health professional. Um, just kind of evaluate them more holistically. That's like one of those questions where I need a lot more information. Um, I, I would definitely get them seen by somebody. All right, thank you. We do have a few questions in Great. the Q&A box and on Facebook. Just a reminder, if you're joining us on Facebook, um, you can put those in the comments section. If you're joining us on Zoom, please put your questions in the Q&A box. And so our first question for you, what do you do if your child's anxiety comes when they talk about negative things? How can you redirect that negative talk? Um, if their anxiety comes around their negative thinking, um, I would handle it kind of the same way. I would wanna know, um, I would wanna understand the source of the negative thinking, like what are they afraid that's going to happen? Um, if the negative, you know, where's that negative thought coming from? Usually the, our negative thoughts are not our own voice. They're usually um, linked to, uh, right, I'm a, if, I, if this doesn't happen, then this, or it's, I believe that I am this because of the following, the following things that happen. So um, the way that it would depend on the child, how old they are, how I would approach it. Um, I'm pretty cognitive as a therapist. So I would probably use the ABC model. I would, uh, I would want to look at the thing that happened. What was our thought? What were our feelings connected to it? And then what are things that we could tell ourselves instead? That's what I like to do that putting my thoughts on trial. Um, that's a really good strategy, but that's not really one that would necessarily work with the little littles. It just kind of depends on the developmental age of the child. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right. So we have a question. Um, if we have a child that's scratching themselves when they get frustrated or upset, even at home and school, just across multiple places, are there any particular strategies that you would recommend that have been helpful? Um, I would want to try to see if we could do something else to replace the scratching. Um, maybe like, maybe there's a stuffed animal that we can scratch. Like, hey, I notice sometimes when you're feeling frustrated, you scratch yourself. Maybe we could scratch, scratch um, you know, teddy bear instead. Maybe we can, um, you know, when I have, um, I've had teens that pick and stuff like that. Um, we've used like rubber bands to kind of pull it pull out our rubber bands to kind of pop the rubber band. We've, I've tried to find a different object to, to link that to if it's kind of just an, a, a compulsive behavior. But again, that might be something to kind of get evaluated um, further to, to really understand what's, you know, what's going on and, and what's triggering that and what, what the scratching is about. <laughs> um, 
All right. Thank you so much. I know we have some additional questions, but um, we want to stay on schedule and move on to our focus group. So I just want to thank you again, Erin, for um, coming today and sharing some really excellent information. If your question was not answered, um, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to um, assist you in any way that we can. Um, so again, just a reminder that we've got this focus group coming up in just a couple of minutes. So um, if you'll bear with me as we go over a couple of things before we get started, I just want to thank you all again. Um, a reminder that there is a recording of today's webinar available on our website at prntexas.org. And if you are needing a certificate of attendance, you will be able to receive um, that certificate after clicking on a link in an email thanking you for today's attendance. Um, very quickly, let's take a look at some upcoming webinars that we have going on. So next week on May 25th, we have a webinar, Should I File a Complaint? If so, what kind? We're going to be doing that in English on Tuesday the 25th at 1215 and in Spanish on Wednesday the 26th also at 1215. And on June 8th, we've got our 87th Texas Legislative Series. We're going to review everything that took place in this legislative session. So join us on June 8th for that. Um, and then also on the screen is our contact information to reach out to us at Partners Resource Network. And I want to thank you again. And we're going to move on to our focus group now. So thanks for sticking with us.